lovely people on this gorgeous and hot Sunday morning. I hope you'll enjoy the heat. It's nice and cool in here. We're going to stand up. We're going to open up the service with the song Welcome by Cliff Roof and Tom
we inspire spiritual transformation, creating a world of love, peace, and prosperity. We are an inclusive spiritual community, inspiring, awakening, and serving in love. Blessing is so beautiful. And let us think of that inner child in each and every one of us. That's not to neglect him or her. Important. And think of the precious children in our in our lives and in the world. By saying, We, we love you. We, we bless, bless you. you. We hold the right to you. We accept you just the way you are. Walk in beauty. You are divine. We're going to go and stand up and sing another song. This is a call and response. So, on the. So, I said, I hear music, and he said, I hear music. And go back and forth, but we all sing together, and the whole wide world is on us. We sing that all together.
also such a powerful symbol of, of the prayers, of that deep longing for connection with that divine, that deep desire in our heart to make things in our world right. However, you know, when we open ourselves to that divine mind, that divine order, we ask, God, heal what needs to be healed. We don't know. We don't know what it is deep within us. We don't know what it is deep within the names and the situations that are within these requests. But we open our hearts in this moment. Open to that awareness that there is one presence and one power. That presence is within me. That presence is within every person in every situation that has been written down. It is in every person in every situation that we hold within our hearts. And knowing this, opening to this divine power, we give grateful thanks that divine order, divine order, is the truth we are open to accepting and to receiving, healing what needs to be healed. And for this we give our grateful thanks, and so it is. Amen.
we know that each and every single one of us has that light of the divine within us. And we let it shine brightly outwards to those around us and to the world. Focus on that light now in the center of your being. The soul light, the divine light, the God light, whatever you want to call it, is within each of us. And it's up to us to let that flame glow grow. See it growing and consuming your whole body. Every little part of your body. Now see it growing larger and larger until it's touching the light of the person next to you, behind you, in front of you. See that light expanding outward to everyone in this town. See it expanding and larger, larger and larger to all of Alabama. And see it expand larger to all the area states expanding larger and larger, touching every single living being and living thing on the earth with that pure unconditional love of the all that is. See it expanding clear around the world, touching every heart, every soul, even of those we may not agree with, even those who may have harmed us. Our light is one light. It all comes from the same source. We are all blessed. We are all powerful. We are loved. With the most powerful love you can imagine. Just sit with that for just a moment. Seeing your light touch everyone and everything in the world. unconditional perfect love. We knew who we are when we came into this life. 
back when we came in, we came in screaming, I'm here. <laughs> and for those who believe in reincarnation, we came in screaming, I'm back. <laughs> then the adults got a hold of us. And they started teaching us how to be human. And sometimes that came with low self-esteem, low self-worth, and feeling less than. Because they can only teach us what they learned as a child and on down the line. So if you can get that in your mind, it can help you from blaming your parents for anything that you might think you have to blame them about. <clears throat> so in order to tell you a little about how I came to where I am today, I need to tell you just a little bit about my past. I grew up feeling really insecure. I had a severe inferiority complex. I couldn't feel good about myself because I thought if I was feeling good about myself, then that was being cocky and God would make something happen to me to break me down a few notches. <laughs> I couldn't feel that I was pretty or had a good body because I believed that God would make something happen to take away my looks because that was being vain. And I had all these thoughts about that. When I was in high school and I would go to any sports games and we lost, guess whose fault it was? I believed it was my fault because I jinxed the game because I was there. I was serious. And I hated myself with a passion. Every time I looked into the mirror or I see a reflection in a window, this is what I would say to myself. You fat, ugly, blaming son of a bleep. Every, I almost said the word in one of these talks, so I have to be careful. Um, but that's what I would say to myself. Every single time I saw my reflection, that's just what I say. Now to be clear, I had really good parents, and they're still good today. They're 83 and 84, so they have some responsibility, but I can't blame them but they're good parents and they were only teaching me what they taught, were learned as a child. So I was raised in a Christian home. My parents were Baptists, but I don't really remember them really forcing their religion on me or their beliefs. But it was my grandparents, my dad's parents, who were the die-hard, born-again, Southern Baptist Christians. <laughs> Everything they believed was right, and everyone who did not believe the way they believed was going to hell. So I remember one time um, I was with my grandparents and they took me to church like they usually do. Well, you know at the end where they sing, just as I am without one plea, they sing it a hundred times to make sure that every single person's come down. Well, I was sitting there and I just happened to look at my grandpa and he's looking down on me and with tears in his eyes, he says, don't you want to go up there and accept Jesus in your heart and become saved? Well, how can you refuse a crying grandpa? So I took that trek down the aisle, knelt down on the stage, and these women prayed over me, and I became a born-again Christian. I didn't really know what that meant. They said, I now have Jesus in my heart, and where he was before that, I don't know. So it kind of <laughs> but he was in my heart now. And then in my senior year, I took the plunge. Literally, I became baptized. So here I am, a bona fide, born-again Christian, and something happened after that. I became a fanatic. And I became the one that everybody was wrong. I was the only one that was right. And if you didn't believe the way I did, you were going straight to hell. <laughs> and I think I jesus everybody to death. And it was a wonder that I even had any friends or family left after that. <laughs> now, I want to be clear, there's nothing wrong with being a Baptist. I know a lot of really wonderful Baptists. My parents are Baptists. So they have their place in this world. So I'm not dissing them. So don't let... You know, don't get that in your mind that I'm trying to bring them down. I'm not. So after I graduated from high school, I had to find out what I wanted to do with my life. I had always wanted to become an actress, but my parents didn't want me to. They thought they were protecting me. So I had to find something else to do. What did I do? I know they'll let me go to a Southern Baptist college. Well, at the Southern Baptist college, you can't dance. You can't go to movies. You can only watch certain TV shows. And there were three of my passions. Well, I knew that wasn't going to work, so I only lasted a quarter. Now what do I do? I had seen the movie Billy Jack in 1971, which got me really interested in Native American Indians. I know. I'll go up there and be a student missionary through my church. We got up there, and the first week of training, it was a real eye-opener because they had all these different religions up there, and they were calling the Indian savages. 1971, they were calling the Indian savages. Well, I knew that wasn't going to work. So I decided I was just going to go live with them and love and accept them just as they are. And that's what I did. We became very close. We sort of adopted each other, and we still keep in touch to this day. But I learned a lot from them, and they planted a lot of seeds in me. I get home. 
Now what do I do? I know, I'll go to horse college for two years. And during that intern, you have to find a job at on a horse ranch. So does anybody know who Wayne Newton is? Yeah? yeah? Okay. I went to work for him for a summer. That, working in Vegas and working for him, sparked my interest in acting again. So I just knew I had, to, I had to do this. I had to take a chance at acting. So I got up by my parents, packed my car, and I went off to Hollywood, California, where everybody told me it was evil. And if I went out there, I was going to go straight to hell, because you know about all those Hollywood people are sinners. I didn't know anybody. I didn't have a place to live. I just went out. And it was a really great time for me. I lived out there for maybe a year and a half. Met a lot of wonderful people within and out of the entertainment business. And I learned that actors and all the people I met out there were just human beings like the rest of us. Planted some more seeds. Now remember, I'm still in my fanatical years. So that planted another seed. My grandmother, the one I was just telling you about, was dying of cancer in Ohio. Well, every time I would talk to her, she would make me feel really guilty for being so far away from her and why am I home being with her because she's dying and I will never see her again if I die before her or if she dies before I come home. So I went home. Broken dreams. I just said, that's it. I don't want anything else to do with God. I don't want anything else to do with religion. I was just not going to believe anything anymore. Now what to do with my life? I studied martial arts for three years and got a black belt in Taekwondo. After class one day, I was talking with the only other woman in that dojo. And we got to talking about religion and spirituality and God and everything. And she got to say, and she said this phrase to me. She says, I believe I am God. Now, I wasn't sure what to say in that, but my mind is going, oh my God, you're going straight to hell. If you think you are God, you are not God. Because God is a mean old man that sits up in the clouds somewhere. But that planted a seed. It planted a seed. While I was there, not at the dojo, but living in this town, I went to a bookstore one time. And I'm perusing the books, and I'm walking around because I love to read, I'm looking at all these books, and I kept getting pulled to the New Age section. Well, I can't touch any of those books because I know I'll be struck dead if I you know, look at them anyway. So I walk around, you know, looking at all these books, and it kept pulling me back to the New Age section. So I look. They're Shirley McLean books. She's an actress. I like her. I could read her books. I can't touch her book. God will strike me dead if I touch her book. <laughs> Where do I walk around a little bit more? And finally, I worked up this courage to pick up the book. Now, I'm serious. This is what I did. And ran away from it. Because I just knew something really bad was going to happen to me just because I touched one of Shirley McLean's books. <laughs> well, I worked up the courage a little more, and I bought one of her books, and I ran out the door knowing that bolt of lightning was going to come and strike me any minute. I read her book and all the other books that she had. And the one thing that she taught me was to keep an open mind in all things. Mm -hmm. Keep an open mind in all things. Now, I really wasn't ready to accept that yet, but it planted another seed. Now, what do I do with my life? My parents were getting kind of tired of me, you know, coming back and forth all the time. So I decided I was going to go to Nashville, Tennessee and be an actress. I went to Nashville, Tennessee, and I worked as a temporary. I did some acting jobs here and there, and I joined two <coughs> dance teams at the Wild Horse Saloon, and I was a regular on their dance TV show. I was having the best time of my life for those five years. Well, some of the, in, the uh, Wild Horse dancers, they were into new thought, and they started telling me about it. They started telling me about the power of our thoughts. They introduced me to religious science and unity. And I thought, maybe I better try going back to church again. I was scared to death to go back to church again, especially a new thought church when I was raised up, you know, to be such a fanatical Christian. There's nothing wrong with fanatical Christians, let me just make that up there. So I'm not just in the main, they have their place. And I remember when I first started going, I would sit down and I would literally, literally have to sit on my hands to keep myself from running out the back door of the church. Literally. So I went to a um, religious science church and they introduced me to meditation. <laughs> this is where my thought processes was back then. You know how they tell you when you meditate, some churches will tell you to put both feet on the floor and get comfortable? There was no way I was going to do that because if I put both feet on the floor, everybody would see how fat my thighs were. <laughs> Literally. 
I mean, if you can imagine people meditating, you know, and then mm, get centered and everything, and then just peek it over. You see how fat her thighs are? <laughs> I mean, that was where my mind was at that time. And I still have troubles not crossing my legs when I'm when I'm meditating. I have to keep them crossed. <laughs> so what I learned though is the power of our thoughts. The power of our thoughts, and it is so important to think positive, to think those loving thoughts that we need. Well, I'm in Nashville for five years, and everything's going really well, I love my life. And I got Wayne Tangle, where I made up Wayne Tangle, by a complete breakdown. I can no longer function in Nashville, so my parents had to come and get me and move in with them, which is about two hours from Nashville, because they had moved down here. I couldn't function, I couldn't do anything. But since I would already started a serious spiritual journey and started learning about our thoughts, I knew what to do to get better. I had to change those thoughts. So I started reading book after book after book, spiritual, motivational, um, new thought, self-help books, and I worked on myself. Now, I was seeing a psychiatrist for four months because I was taking a new um, antidepressant, so I had to you know, see her. But she told me, she says, Karen, you know what to do better. You just paid me $80 to tell you the same things you're telling yourself. She said she never had another patient like me because I wanted to move forward with my life. Where a lot of patients, when they're consumed with depression, they're happy being miserable because that's all they know. It's become their identity. So I started to heal. Now, what are some of the things that I learned? Number one, I learned that my identity isn't who I am out there, but it is who I am within. Very important. And it's really important that you change your thoughts. If I told you, imagine a, a huge elephant up here with purple polka dots, can you do it? Can you see it? Mm -hmm. Now, if I ask you to change it to a rhinoceros with a green monkey sitting on it, can you imagine it? Mm -hmm. See how quick you change your thoughts? Mm -hmm. It's possible. Now, that doesn't make, it mean it's easy, because sometimes we have those physical, chemical things going in our bodies that make it almost difficult for us to just change our thoughts. It's not easy. I also had to stop worrying about what other people think. Anybody do that? <laughs> Terry Cole Whitaker had a book and something like the title, What Other People Think of Me is None of My Business. <laughs> so when I start worrying about you know, what people are thinking and everything, I think about that phrase and I'm like, it's not, it's not about them, it's about me. I'm responsible for my own thoughts. Now, when it, when it comes to, let's say, worrying about people's thoughts, they say that public speaking is the number one fear. I would think jumping out of an airplane without a parachute would kind of trump that, but I, I don't know. But I got to thinking about that. And it's not about the fear of public speaking. It's worrying about what you all think about the public speaking. If you knew you were going to be a great speaker, would you be afraid to get up there and speak, whether it's up here or in small groups? So stop worrying about what other people think. I also had to stop comparing myself to other people, which is, I was really good, especially as a speaker. I think I need to be on the level of Wayne Dyer and Michael Bernard Beckwith. And then I think, I can't do that. I, I, I can't do that. I start getting also insecure and everything and, and uh, losing my confidence. And then the Spirit will give me that spiritual smack on the back of the head and say, Karen, they were where you are at one point when they started. So stop comparing yourself. And I also learned that you have to really, really love and accept yourself as you are. As you are. And that's hard to do, especially if you're looking in the mirror at your naked body. Because I mean, there's a lot of times, you know, when I'm there, I have to go like this, I don't look at myself. I have to peek around at me. I have to learn to embrace everything, even the little fat cells and everything that are in my body. We have to love and accept ourselves as we are. So what are some of the things I did to change my thoughts? Well, one of the biggest things was I had to learn to um, think of God differently. Rather than seeing this man, old, you know, no man sitting in the sky, Passing judgments and everything, I now think he's just an energy through everyone and everything. And that changed my concept completely. And I've also changed the name of God. I don't like the name of God. I don't know anybody. Especially my parents. <laughs> so I changed it. It's okay. God doesn't care what you call him, her, it. You know, call it anything you want. Sometimes I love the word life because life is through everyone and everything. And Wayne Dyer taught me to take the labels off of everything. If you take the labels off of everything, you realize that we are pure energy. Well, I was standing outside one day after reading that, and I just started taking the labels off of everything. And it only happened for a couple seconds, but I saw it. I saw it. Everything just melded with each other. It was just all one energy. There were no trees. There was no me. There was no grass. That put in my mind. Everything is one energy. 
Now, when it comes to Jesus, Jesus taught us to be the greatest expressions of who we were meant to be. In fact, I really think he was the original author of the song, Anything You Can Do, I Can Do Better. Anything You Can Do, I Can Do Too. Because he said he, you could do the same things he did. So why can't we have confidence and love ourselves? Get past all that humanness that we have. It's, it's easy, but it's difficult, depending on what we really believe. But we're humans. We also have that humans. We have spiritual body in, and we're a spiritual person inside of us. But we have that humanness that we have to deal with. And sometimes that gets in the way. I think some people call it ego. You are love beyond measure. Love, 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 love beyond measure. I'd like to read a quote by Father Joseph Langford. No relation. Really listen to this. If we were to take all the love in every heart of everyone on earth and add it to all the love of all those who ever existed throughout history, then add the love of all saints in heaven and direct that love to ourselves, it would still fall infinitely short of the love God is pouring out on each and every one of us right now. Because God is infinite. His love is not divided, with each of us receiving but a portion. We each receive the totality, the fullness of divine love, 24 hours a day, every day of our lives. Mm -hmm. That doesn't even begin to describe the love that we have. I'm going to do a little exercise here. Um, you're going to take about three, four people outside for just a quick moment. Okay, the volunteers. These two. Yeah. Those two. Are going. Oh. oh, both of these two. Yeah. Okay, come on. Yeah. Hope you come back. I hope you do. Please let me get us when we need to come in. Right? Somebody will come get you. Yes, thank you. Okay, here's what I want you to do. The universe celebrates you. God celebrates you. I want you to play God. Well, you are God, but I want you to play him too. Her, it. I want you to be the universe. When I have them come back in, I want everybody to stand, start applauding, face them and start applauding, and yell to them, I love you, you're wonderful, you're magnificent. Any positive thing you can say to them, just yell and keep doing it until I tell you to stop. Does everybody understand that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Could somebody go get them in, please? Really, really do it up. We did this in a hotel once. Everybody heard us. Magnificence of the universe. 
what you see in here, whatever you look like, this is God. Know that, claim it, believe it. <laughs> and it's still it's kind of hard when I look in the mirror thinking that's God, but God has, you know, all the stuff that I criticize, the squiggles. I had a child say, you have squiggles on your face. <laughs> They'll tell you the truth. I want to give you a quote, and many of you have probably heard this. It's by Marianne Williamson, one of my favorite quotes. Really let this sink in. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is not our light. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us. It's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. I love that quote, and I would highly recommend that you print it out, and you know, whenever you're feeling down and inadequate, and like that little spark isn't as shiny as it should be, read that quote, because that tells us who we are. We are beautiful. We are magnificent. I left the cleaning lady in the hotel a note saying thank you. Thank you for all you do. And I said, you are beautiful and magnificent and very much appreciated. Can you imagine a cleaning person getting that or a garbage man or anybody? You really need to show your appreciation. So what I would like to do is everybody stand. We're going to do a few affirmations. I would like you to, if you can't stand, it's okay. I would like you to do this with gusto. And I'm going to say the affirmation and I want you to repeat it after me. Ready? I'm throwing it out to you to catch it. I am wonderful. I am wonderful. I am beautiful. I am beautiful. Louder. I am magnificent. I am magnificent. I am miraculous. I am miraculous. I am the best there. Just love them. 
But most of all, with yourself. Because if you don't keep that well within you, filled with all that unconditional, perfect love, unconditional, you're not going to have anything to give. I know a lot of parents say that they have to put their family first, especially moms. And what do they do on an airplane when the when the thing comes down? Put it on you first, and then your child. You have to love yourself unconditionally first before you would have that to give to anybody else. It's not easy. But do those affirmations. When you look in the mirror, you can sing. <clears throat> oh, Lord, it's hard to be humble. When you're perfect in every way. I can't wait to look in the mirror. I look better looking each day. To know me is to love me. I must be a heck of a woman. Oh, ma'am. Oh, Lord, it's hard to be humble. But I'm doing the best that I can. And that's all you can do. It's the best that you can. And just keep working at it. Keep working on it till the day you die. Because I'll tell you one thing. It's not going to happen just like that. I would like to thank all of you for being here. I appreciate it. And I send you all love and light. And I wish you much love as you go out your way. Good health, prosperity, friendships. And thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Reverend Karen. Karen, thank you for that. I'm going to get my music set back up. Okay, we're going to go ahead and stand up and sing a song, Heaven Tied Me, by Aria. It's a very slowy. I'll guide you through. We sing it three times through. Pretty much what you see on the screen is a whole song. 